top boxing news. Okay, we'll start with this. A few choice words from the former unified champion, Michaela Mayer, in reference to her old buddy, Alicia Baumgartner, and how she's focused on a mandatory crack at a 135-pound title. Feels she will be at her best at 140. Michaela May has always been a tall drink of boxing at 130 pounds, always had generous physical dimensions. When Mayer was asked if a rematch could happen later on this year against Baumgartner, the 2016 United States Olympian was not optimistic. No, and it's not because of me. Baumgartner has to want to fight Mayer told BoxingScene.com in an interview. She's the champion now. She has the belts. The ball is in her court. I can only do but so much and say, give me the rematch. Everyone knows I want the rematch, so ask her. Until then, I have to move on and continue my career and try to make big fights. I heard a blurb about Michaela Mayer potentially fighting on the undercard of Senecia Estrada's next fight, which could go down in July. In July, here's stateside, and almost immediately, the name of Katharina Fenders comes to mind. Would be a common opponent between Michaela and Terry Harper. Michaela Mayer fought Lucy Wildheart only because Christina Lenardatu was not cleared to fight by the British Boxing Board of Control during the weigh-in 24 hours before the fight. I didn't know anything about Wildheart, but it gave me the freedom to completely be myself, said Mayer. There was something exciting with having no game plan and knowing nothing about my opponent. I'm happy I got the fight and was able to get the rounds in, but I am here for the big fights. I've always said that. As the W BC's interim champion at 135 pounds. Mayer is the mandatory challenger for the eventual winner of a rematch between Katie Taylor and Amanda Serrano. Katie's going to be returning to action later on this month at 140 pounds opposite the ring. That division's undisputed champion, Chantel Cameron. Provided things go to plan, Katie will then move back down to lightweight and see about fighting Amanda for a second time. The problem is that Amanda is set to return to action later on this year in August. If Katie's fighting in May and Amanda is fighting in August, that would put a rematch between them later on in the year towards the end of it, and I don't know, November or December? Possibly. Meaning, short of an order from the WBC, Michaela Mayer may not have access to the WBC title. Perhaps not. Not this year. It all depends. Area material. I'm focused on facing the winner of Taylor versus Serrano. I'll guarantee Baumgartner will come knocking after that, said Mayer. I'm gonna stay busy and fight in the meantime. I might have two fights before I get the mandate mandatory shot. It'll happen, and honestly, I'm not staying at 135 pounds very long. A year or two to accomplish goals. I know I went up a division in my last fight. I still think my best is at 140. It might be. Michaela Mayer has always had very generous physical dimensions for 130 pounds. Even now, at 135, she's a tall drink of boxing. 140 might very well turn out to be her best weight, and given that Katie's about to fight there. She's about to fight Chantel. If she beats Chantel and she vacates those titles afterwards, Michaela might move up then. Think about it. If Katie beats Chantel, gets all those belts, then decides she doesn't want to stay at 140, the reset button gets hit on the division. At which point, Katie moves back down, sees about scheduling a rematch with Amanda, and while that's going on, maybe Michaela decides, I don't want to stay at 135, I'll move up to 140 and get a belt there. Instead of waiting around for the winner of Taylor versus Serrano. Michaela Mayer added, via her social media, there's a reason Alicia Baumgartner fought Elem Mechaled instead of the number one contender, Delphine Pursun, for undisputed. Hashtag Bump Gartner Pursuit should be mandatory soon. I'm looking forward to it. We're not on the eve of Baumgartner versus Mayer, in case you haven't noticed, but we may be closer to Baumgartner versus Pursun, and all Pursun's gotta do is beat Bo Mi Ray Shin. If she does, she becomes the mandatory challenger to Alicia Baumgartner. Michaela Mayer is suggesting that the matchmaking in Baumgartner versus Ele Mechaled wasn't by accident, it was by design. Sounds a lot like what she's trying to say is they swerved Delphine Pursun. To that, Eddie Hearn himself responded by saying the fight with Pursun was ordered by the WBA first. Pursun said she wasn't available. Just what I told you. I know a lot of you guys would have preferred to see Baumgartner versus Pursun instead of Baumgartner versus Mechaled, but Delphine was busy. It's what I was hearing at the time, and this is confirmation of that. Though as long as Delphine makes it through Bo Mi Ray Shin, she becomes Alicia Baumgartner's problem. We're not on the eve of Baumgartner versus Mayer 2. We may be on the eve of Baumgartner versus Pursun. And if Michaela's courting the idea of moving up to 140, 
in the near future, that puts even more distance between her and Alicia Baumgartner. At any point in the next 12 months, Michaela ends up going to 140. I don't think Alicia's gonna follow her up there. I don't think. And as long as she's undisputed champion in the women's super featherweight division, all those girls in all those ranks, they're gonna be gunning for her, Delphine Pursuit included. So it's going to be interesting to see how all of this breaks down. No surprise that Yard won that poll. Um, to answer your question, if I'm ready for a yes, I think it was good that, hence why I said it was good that I did the 10 rounds against Stefian. And now if Yard is the man for me to box next, I'm more than happy to make that happen. Um, I've made it clear um, many, many times, and so I keep, keep the same energy today. May I ask you, the, the world titles look to be tied up at the moment. I mean, notably, Callum Smith um, should face Arta Betabiev now. Top rank have won that purse bid. Uh, and Bivol, you know, there's plenty of options for Bivol. If you fought Anthony Yard and there were no titles on the line, it was just an all-London derby and the battle of each other, would that uh, be a spanner in the works? Does that sort of fight have to be a world title? Is it big enough on its own? I think it's big enough on its own. Um, maybe a few years ago, I would have said, let there be a title, but for now... We, people are fighting each other, man, and I don't want to, again, have the narrative that I should have, would have fought this guy, but we didn't make it happen because nothing was on the line. While the titles are tied up, let's do something. Didn't I tell you this would happen? Yeah. Isn't this exactly what I told you would happen? Yeah. He turns down Callum Smith. Yeah. He turns down Dimitri Bivol. He even turns down Anthony Yard so he could go over there to Sky and Boxer and start talking about those guys. In this particular instance, he's talking about Anthony Yard. Anthony Yard, who's supposed to be returning this summer in a decent-sized fight, rumored to be against former champion Joe Smith Jr. Obviously, I'm not against Buatzi versus Yard as a fight. I only question Joshua Buatzi's earnestness in making that fight because his actions... Does he mean business? Does he really mean business? Because you're essentially talking about a fight that you were already offered and you turned it down. You turned it down on the premise that that fight came with strings attached. That's the industry standard, though. The same way a fight with Dimitri Bivol came with strings attached at Matchroom is the same way an Anthony Yard fight came with strings attached at Queensbury. That's the industry standard, though. What if I told you that Anthony Yard in defeat was more well-received than Joshua Buatzi in victory. After Yard versus Better Beef, all you could hear about was how it was a great fight, an entertaining fight, whereas Joshua Buatzi, all you could hear about is how boring his last fight was for fighting the Powell Stippians of the world. You might as well have gone to Queensbury. You could have fought a guy like that at Queensbury. En route to an Anthony Yard fight, but Joshua Buatzi chose to go to Sky Sports and Boxer, where none of the premier light heavyweights are. And why do you think he did that? None of the big names are over there. You went to Sky Sports and Boxer so you could start talking about an Anthony Yard fight immediately after your Boxer debut. Right after. I'm not against the fight. Don't misunderstand me. I'm saying the fight is now harder to make based on Joshua Buatzi's actions that for crossing over to Sky Sports and Boxer and fighting the Powell Stippians of the world, you could have fought a guy like that on Queensbury en route to the yard fight. But you went to Boxer. So the question now becomes, all right, you want to do that fight? Right. Are you going to cross the street? Somebody has to, because somebody has to. It's either Joshua Buanzi goes to Queensbury or Anthony Yard goes to Boxer. Somebody has to. Frank don't want to send his prize stallion at light heavyweight over there to Sky Sports and Boxer. I'd wager he doesn't want that. Reminds me of the Joseph Parker versus Joe Joyce fight. Joseph Parker had inked a fresh deal with the people over there at Sky Sports and Boxer, but when push came to shove, he had the Joe Joyce fight on the Queensbury side of things. Might be how all of this breaks down if Joshua Buatzi is serious about fighting Anthony Yard, because I'd wager right here and right now, Anthony, in spite of coming off a loss, has more marquee value than Joshua Buatzi does coming off a win. Anthony needs a rebound fight. This is a very big fight in the United Kingdom, make no mistake. Buatzi versus Yard puts asses in the seats, but I think to really build it up as best as you can, you need to let Anthony get back in the winner's bracket. It's a double-edged sword. If you put Anthony in there with Joe Smith Jr. over the summer, Smoke and Joe may jeopardize this fight. But if you don't allow Anthony a rebound fight, it's less than opportune 
for Anthony. He's coming right off a loss, a knockout loss to Artur Betterbeef. You're going to put him in another tough fight straight away. It's a double-edged sword. This fight does good business, make no mistake. It does. Though I question the earnestness of Joshua Buatzi, whether or not he's being serious. And is this a response to the negative reception, the negative reaction that this past weekend's fight got? Is that why he's bringing up some fighter that's on some other side of the street? Because he knows his last fight was a stinker. Ian Crawford, we was talking directly. We actually, we were probably all calling for probably 40 minutes, 30 minutes. You know, just, you know, we probably spent probably 15 minutes talking about, you know, in the negotiation part and stuff like that. We should talk about, you know, getting a feel for each other and, uh, you know, basically talking about our families and, you know, the current situation we had going on and stuff like that. And then we start talking about, you know, boxing and us fighting and negotiations and things like that. But it went well and um, was, our teams are still negotiating and we're still having you know, talks. So it's going, it's going very well. I don't scare anybody or anything like that. I'm you know, trying to fight the best competition out there. There's no reason why I'm, I'm trying to fight you know, Crawford. I'm a man of my word, and uh, like I said, if I get this third belt, you know, I'm coming to him. Get God belts on my side, you know, I'm coming to him. Yeah. You know, I'm not trying to fight anybody else but him. So, yeah. you know, that's yeah. part of the reason yeah. why, you know, I'm sitting out this long, too, because, you know, there's just one person I'm trying to fight. That clarification comes to us by way of Errol Spence Jr. And what is the latest timestamp in this ongoing saga that spans something like four or five years? I don't think that many people have the same energy they used to have in reference to this fight, though an official announcement... That would energize them. That would galvanize them. And this year, unlike previous years, I actually think the fight might happen. I've been hearing a lot in reference to this fight. I've talked about it here on the channel before this latest interview was uploaded, that based on what I'm hearing, these guys are in negotiations and it's looking like they're gonna fight. There's even a rumor floating around about some Saudi involvement. The Saudi Arabian prince might be interested in not only bankrolling a heavyweight monster matchup card towards the end of this year, but this fight as well, though it's all tentative. It's all rumors. As far as the Saudi stuff it is, as far as Errol Spence Jr., he says he's been corresponding with Terrence Crawford directly over the phone, and the reason he's been out so long, it's already been a year since his last fight, is because this is the only fight that he wants to have though in truth it doesn't favor him it doesn't better his chances of victory that he's been out so long terence crawford has fought in the last 12 months late last year errol spence jr hasn't nope. and even before the intermittent stints of inactivity the injuries the car accidents i already favored terence crawford to beat this guy you tack on all this other stuff terence may be older than errol spence jr but he doesn't have as much wear and tear as oh. errol spence jr that car accident that retina injury he is, in fact, a more active fighter than Errol Spence Jr. Neither guy fights all that much, but Terrence still fights more on average than Errol. You don't want to go shaking off ring rust in a fight like this. This is an undisputed title fight we're talking about. But that is the environment for the fight that Errol Spence Jr. and his handlers have created. The most opportune time to do this thing was circa 2018, 2019, before the accident. You prioritize the fight with Mikey Garcia, a fight with Sean Porter, even though those weren't the fights that the fans were asking for, they were clamoring for a Crawford fight. You put that fight on the back burner, you had those fights instead. One thing leads to another. No brother. Four to five years later, here we are. And while I would purchase the pay-per-view if they actually get the fight over the line, it seems much more obvious to me that Terrence beats this guy. It's not the same. I used to think of it as a closer fight before. Before the intermittent stints of inactivity, before the accident, before the injuries. It seemed like a closer fight to me before. Now, I don't know, I guess Errol Spence Jr. wants to keep his word. Could be that. Or it could be that Errol's running out of options. Options for a big fight. You could go to 154, fight somebody up there, but it's not going to yield the same return that this fight might. This is the only one that's got build-up. This is the only one that's got backstory. This fight is for all the marbles. For Errol Spence Jr. and Terrence Crawford jointly, this is the biggest fight that either of those guys can hope to make. Errol's focused on that fight. 
at least according to Errol, according to Errol, on who Canelo Alvarez should fight next. David Benavidez would be a good-ass fight. I think he should stay away from Dimitri Bivol. Shit, he should stay away from Artur Better Beef, too. Go back to 168 and handle your business. 175 pounds is pushing it. And I happen to agree. Both David Benavidez and Demetrius Andre jointly, they've fought in the last 12 months. David was in action not that long ago opposite the ring Caleb Plant. And earlier this year on the undercard of Hector Garcia versus Gervonta Davis, we saw Demetrius Andre take on journeyman Desmond Nicholson. For me and my money, Canelo Alvarez should pursue those fights. So much more winnable fights than a B-Vol rematch. You've heard me say that plenty of times. I feel like Canelo Alvarez has a very good working relationship with the people at Matchroom. And I don't know, maybe he wants the fight to happen under the matchroom banner. If that proves to be a problem and you can't get David to cross the street, get Demetrius. How long has that guy been riding your wave, using your name for clout? Shut that guy up already. There's a section of the boxing community to where Canelo Alvarez can't win no matter what he does. Even if he is a more accomplished fighter than his contemporaries, certainly more active. More proven, there's a section of the boxing community that no matter what this guy does, it ain't good enough. So you can fight David, you can fight Demetrius. You don't need to run it back with Demetrius. It's not necessary. And there's no shame in maxing out at 175. There's no shame in saying that that's a mountain too high to climb. One mountain too high. I'd prefer Canelo fight Demetrius or he fight David. Two guys that I'm sick of hearing about. I'm sick of seeing people prop these guys up. Talk these guys up. Behind their creative and opportunistic matchmaking. Nothing would please me more than an official announcement that Canelo would be fighting one of them in September. Leave Dimitri alone. Errol is right. Maybe that's a fight you can revisit later on, but for the time being, take out the trash at 168 pounds, because that's what David Benavidez and Demetrius are. Trash. Garbage resumes. I don't even think Demetrius believes he can win that fight. He just wants to get paid. That's the mentality that guy's got. Demetrius ain't got a competitor's mentality. It's not that he wants to compete. He just wants to get paid. Why do you think he swerved Zach Parker? Why do you think he swerved Yanni Beck, drunk on his driveway, begging Chris Eubank Jr. to fight him? While he was under orders to fight Yanni Beck. It's time to bust these hype jobs bubble. Canelo needs to take care of those guys.